why don't we just get started by looking at our passage together. So I want to start by asking you, do you ever remember a time when you were younger and maybe you were in a store and you got separated from your parents and before you know it, you were kind of lost and all of a sudden the store seemed so much bigger, almost like a maze and the people around seemed a little bit more sinister and intimidating and you weren't sure where you were. Or perhaps you've seen it from the other side. You just turn your back for a moment and you look around and you think, where are my kids? And that icy cold grip of panic starts to try to get at your heart and you try not to panic and you just look for your loved ones. Now, regardless of which side you approach it on, being lost is never a comfortable experience, is it? But uh, that's actually what our story this morning is about. We're going to read about a man who was lost. Now, he knew where he was, but he had to be found all the same. And we're going to read how Jesus seeks him out, and his story represents all of our stories. And Jesus is seeking for us, even if we're kind of okay with being lost, even if we don't know it, he is seeking for us if he hasn't already found us. Now, um, Jesus is like a loving parent who searches out for lost ones. And I hope that as we look over this, what is a very familiar story? If you went to Sunday school when you were longer, younger, maybe you've been hearing about Zacchaeus your entire life. But I hope as we can dig a little bit deeper, we might be able to find some fresh truths and make this story come back alight again. So uh, before we get into it, though, let's just ask for God's blessing in prayer. Father, we come before your presence and we acknowledge that we are always dependent upon you. So, Lord, we pray that you would open up this passage to our hearts and our minds. And if we are um, distracted, help us to focus. If we feel like this is too um, basic for us, may you humble us and remind us that we need always to hear the gospel message. And God, in all things, uh, may we please you and honor you at this time, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, let's just start out by uh, rereading verses 1 to 5. And just to get that first part of the story back in our mind. It says this, he, encountered Jer he entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So in verse 1, we discover that Jesus is traveling through Jericho, the city where this takes place. You see, he is traveling with actually another, uh, a number of other pilgrims, and they're on pilgrimage to go to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover together. And as these pilgrims are traveling through, some of the local residents, they come out to meet them because they want to meet Jesus. He's become quite famous. And in verse 2, we are introduced to one of these local residents, a man named Zacchaeus. He is described as a very wealthy chief tax collector. Now, this isn't the first time we've come across tax collectors as we've go, been going through this mini sermon series in Luke. And from this, we've discovered that tax collectors were Jewish men who worked for their Roman conquerors to gather taxes for Rome. And they, they did this because they could charge extra taxes and pocket that money for themselves. They did it so they could get rich, and they could get rich this way, and as a result of this behavior, they were rather hated by their fellow countrymen as greedy betrayers of their own country. Now, we, we've seen some of that before, but Zacchaeus isn't your average tax collector. He's actually a chief tax collector. That means he's in charge of tax collection for the entire region, and Jericho was the perfect place for him to be situated because it was an important city lying on a couple trade routes and so he could kind of maximize his profits by being in this location and um he wouldn't have actually collected taxes himself anymore 
he would have had other underlings, other tax collectors do it for him, and they would have to give him a cut of all that they took from people. <clears throat> so if, if we think about it, if tax collectors were very rich and very hated, that means Zacchaeus is even more rich and even more hated. And, and we, we see here that as he goes out as part of this local crowd, his desire, it says, is he was seeking Jesus to see who he was. Now, we're not sure all of what that means, but that means he's not really coming to Jesus with questions or with faith in him as the Messiah. Instead, he just kind of wants to get a look at him, to know a little bit more about him. And we've seen this with celebrities in our day. If you see a celebrity, they seem to gather a crowd around them. People want to look at them, maybe talk to them, maybe get an autograph or a selfie or something like that. Well, I'm not sure Zacchaeus is looking for an autograph or a selfie, but he has that kind of motive, it would seem. At least that's what many of the crowd are there. They want to get to look at Jesus a little bit more. Now, the problem that he has is it says he's small in stature. So he's a short guy, and he can't see Jesus for the crowd. But I've got an issue with this. I think I can speak on this as a short guy myself. That's not a very good reason. Because you can kind of weave your way through a crowd until you get to a spot where you can see. I've done it many times myself. Why doesn't Zacchaeus do it? Well, in order to weave through the crowd, you've got to have people that kind of see you're short and they let you through because they know they can still see over you. And people would have known that about Zacchaeus. He was short, but they wouldn't have let him through right? How many of them had he ripped off on taxes? They knew who he was. They weren't going to do him any favors. They weren't going to make room for him. And so he, he, he's got a bit of a problem, but we understand that he didn't get to the top of the food chain of tax collectors without being resourceful and clever. So in verse four, we see he just kind of looks down the road, projects where Jesus is going to go, and he sees a sycamore tree there. He's got a plan. He'll just go over, he'll climb the tree, he'll still be able to see Jesus. Now, a sycamore tree was the perfect tree for this because it had low, thick branches that branched out almost sideways. It was really easy to climb. But it's still a weird thing for Zacchaeus to do. I mean, think about it. Maybe when you were young, you liked climbing trees. But how often do you ever see an adult climbing a tree? replace adult with a high profile business person when's the last time you saw that and if you've got them in a suit in your head because they're a businessman change it instead to a robe because that's what they would have worn back then a robe and we all know that there's a reason why we don't let our daughters climb trees when they're wearing dresses it would be inappropriate for him to be climbing a tree in a robe now add into all of this the fact that he's from an honor shame society where it's so important that you do things that bring honor to your family and don't shame them by doing anything undignified, like being a grown man, climbing a tree, wearing a robe. This is really undignified. This isn't the right thing for Zacchaeus to do. What's going on here? He wouldn't do this for just a glance at a celebrity. Something more is happening. There is more than just a passing interest in who Jesus is in this man's heart. He's willing to dishonor himself to get a little bit closer. What is happening? Well, I believe that he thinks if he gets in this tree, he won't just see Jesus, but as he's walking by, he'll get to hear what he's saying. He'll get to hear a little bit of Jesus' teaching. Now, you might think that's a little extreme just to hear a little teaching, but bear with me. Because you see, as a tax collector, he might have found it a little bit hard to just join that crowd, even if they'd receive him and listen to Jesus teach. Because he's not exactly living the pious life to join all these pilgrims who are going on pilgrimage to, to worship God, Passover in the capital, at the temple. Is he going to join them? What might they say? They might find that a little bit hypocritical of him. They might say to him, hey, Zacchaeus, why don't you quit your job, stop betraying our country, and then maybe then you can come and listen to a little bit, right? he might decide that it is easier for him to take a little dishonor on himself and climb that tree than risk humiliation and rejection, not just by his um, fellow citizens of Jericho, but maybe even by Jesus himself. Maybe it's easier to get that little soundbite. But if that's what he was thinking, he couldn't have been more wrong. Because 
in verse 5, things turn out completely differently, don't they? I mean, he's getting exactly what he's looking for. He's up in his little perfect perch in the tree, looking down. There's Jesus coming right along the road as he saw. He gets to see him. He gets to hear him. But then all of a sudden, Jesus stops. And he looks up, and he locks eyes with Zacchaeus, and he calls him by name. I bet you. I bet you Zacchaeus was tempted to look around and say, is there another Zacchaeus in this tree he's talking to? I mean, how does he know his name? If he hadn't been hanging on tight, I bet you he would have fallen right out of that tree in that moment. That would have been a very shocking experience. Look what, what Jesus said to him, too. Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. I mean, hurry and come down. That's got to give him flashbacks of when he was a kid, and his mother would call to him, hey, Zacchaeus, hurry up, come down from that tree. It's dinner time. Come on in. Probably no one had spoken spoken to this prestigious chief tax collector this way since he was a little child, this commanding tone, hurry and come down. And then he says, I must stay at your house today. Literally, he's saying, it is necessary that I stay at your house today. See, Jesus saw this as a divine need, as part of God's plan. See, Zacchaeus didn't know it, but while he was seeking Jesus, Jesus was also seeking him. It may not have been penciled into his calendar book, but he had an appointment to meet with Jesus, whether he knew it or not. And, and Jesus is not surprised. He knew his name, he knew where he'd be, and he knew what, where he'd be spending that very day with Jesus as his guest. Now, we've seen Zacchaeus had more than a passing interest. He was quite interested in Jesus, but still a little bit unsure, just wanting to know more about him. But we also see now that Jesus is very interested in Zacchaeus, isn't he? He considers it an absolute necessity that they meet this day. See, he knows he is traveling for the last time to Jerusalem, and that in a few weeks, he will be crucified there. And so this is the last time he passes through Jericho, and he has a pressing need to meet with Jericho's chief tax collector before he's done, before his time on earth is finished. So Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus, and he's still seeking people like Zacchaeus today, people like you and me. I don't know what brought you to church today. Maybe you're just walking by and you saw us. Maybe you checked us out on the internet. Maybe you had a friend that invited you here. Or maybe you came out of habit or family obligation or genuine interest. Whatever your reason, I want to suggest to you that it's no coincidence that you are here today. That you have the potential of a divine appointment to meet with Jesus that is essential for you not to miss, even today. Even if you are seeking Jesus in the smallest of ways. I want us to see from this passage that Jesus is already seeking you. you. You didn't come up with this idea first. He's been pursuing you, and he is continuing to seek you. And you can be found by him if you want. You can encounter him, and that encounter will change your life. Let's read and continue our story and see how it began to change Zacchaeus' life. We'll look at verses 6 and 7 now says this, so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. So um, have you ever had someone invite themselves over to your home before? Imagine somebody you've never met this morning comes up to you after the meeting and says, hey, it is great to meet you. You know what? I've got to come over to your house later today. I'll be there at six for dinner. I'm looking forward to it. See you then. After you picked your jaw up off the floor, you'd probably be a little bit outraged and offended by something like that, right? We all know that you can't just invite yourself over to someone's house, let alone someone that you've never met before. Actually, Anne and I used to have something like this fairly often when we were in China. She would be at home. I've told you this before. She'd get a phone call from some of the girls and they'd say, Ann, are you busy right now? She'd say, no. Oh, we're at your door right now. And then they'd stay for dinner. Well, were we offended? Were we outraged? No, actually, we were glad 
They were our friends. We wanted to spend time for them. We were glad if they stayed for dinner. We wanted to talk with them. Look how Zacchaeus responds to this forced invitation. He's not offended. First of all, he does exactly like he's told. Jesus said, hurry and come down. So he hurries and he comes down. And then he receives Jesus joyfully here, doesn't he? Right? He's, he's happy that this has happened. He, he, he's, the fact that he was up that tree in the first place means that he really wanted to know more about Jesus. He just felt unworthy. He felt he could be rejected. He didn't dare to dream that he could ever even sit under Jesus' feet and learn from him. But now he's actually going to get to host Jesus and have long conversations to him. This, is, this isn't an imposition. This isn't an inconvenience. For Zacchaeus, this is a dream come true. He loves that this is the case. And while Zacchaeus is really excited about this, verse 7 shows us the crowd is not so much the same. In fact, they're not happy about this at all. They know who Zacchaeus is, how many of them have been ripped off by his overcharged taxes. So they hated Zacchaeus. They didn't want Jesus to accept him. They wanted Jesus to push him down, to reject him, to tell him how awful he is, because they believe Zacchaeus is completely unworthy, a total waste of time for someone like Jesus. See, they they didn't realize the great irony of this passage. They think Zacchaeus is totally unworthy, but he is no less unworthy than any one of them. In fact, he seems to be the only one that is truly eager to learn from Jesus compared to the supposedly religious crowd that Jesus is surrounded by. He is eager, so much so that Jesus planned to spend an entire day with this man, though he has only a very limited amount of days left before his mission on earth is completed. So it is interesting that Jesus chose to meet with this man because Jesus saw the state of his soul. That's what the crowd didn't see. They could just look at the exterior. And, and that's the problem with being part of the judgmental crowd. We, we don't get it right. We can't see where people are really at. I mean, who'd have thought that our little corrupt chief tax collector from Jericho would be eager to learn more about God and his truths? Who would have thought that? See, the problem for us is we can never really guess. And the question then comes to us, I mean, how many bikers, how many convicts, how many hardened atheists, how many shallow materialists, how many faithful Muslims do we ignore in our gospel call because we think they would never listen, so why bother trying? God couldn't change a person like that. That's what we think. How many do we overlook? You see, the problem is we've got to stop thinking we are good judges of where someone's soul is really at and whether they can be reached by Jesus or not because we are not good judges of that at all. See, we would never, we, we, we've never guess the kinds of sinners that Jesus is seeking. He's seeking anyone. He's seeking everyone. So we mustn't limit his mercy and his grace. It is far greater than we even think. But we need to be honest about who Zacchaeus is. He isn't just a guy who's small in stature. He's a guy with a small heart. He's a guy with pretty meager morals. This is not a nice guy. Let's not sugarcoat and paint Zacchaeus in the wrong way. I mean, if, if we were back then, we probably wouldn't have been friends with Zacchaeus either, right? But uh, Z Jesus still took the time to reach out to him with this gospel message, with the little time that he had left. And I think that needs to teach us that no one is beneath our Savior, so let no one be beneath our time and effort to reach them with the gospel, right? Uh, if, if he wasn't too small to be noticed by our Lord, then let no one be too insignificant to be noticed and reached out to by us. See, we've been entrusted with a gospel message for everyone. So we need to be willing to share to whomever we can, whenever we can, however we can. That's got to be our attitude. See, everyone needs this message. Zacchaeus teaches us 
that no one is too small to be found. No one is too small to be found. Maybe you feel a little bit like Zacchaeus this morning. Maybe you feel unworthy, right? Not, not worthy enough for God's attention. You've done too many things that you regret, made too many mistakes. But I want to tell you, Jesus is still seeking you this morning. Or, or maybe you feel insignificant, like people don't give you the time of day, you're ignored, you're passed over. But Jesus isn't going to pass you by. He's going to stop. He's calling you by name. Hurry. Hurry and come. The question before you is, will you? Why not receive Jesus as a guest in your life and in your heart? Why not give him a hearing like Zacchaeus did? Let's read the transformation that results from Zacchaeus' choice to receive Jesus. We'll just read verses 8 and 9 next. It says this, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. So, um, in verse 6, we read how Zacchaeus joyfully received Jesus in the past tense. So I take verse 8 to actually be a change in scene where they're actually at Zacchaeus' house now. And that would make sense for Zacchaeus standing. This is probably after a dinner that they've had with Zacchaeus and his family, maybe some of his co-workers and friends. And he gets up after dinner and he gives a bit of a speech. Actually, it turns out to be a bit of an oath, doesn't it? And he promises to give 50% of his worldly goods, all of his wealth, 50% of it to the poor. And in in the Bible, we call that a thank offering. It's an expression of gratitude to God, and it's an act of worship to God. And at this point, we know he is very thankful to God, but we're not exactly sure why he's so thankful. That's still remaining to be seen at this point. And um, he decides to give 50%. And today, we could think of a modern example of that. And it's called the giving pledge. I don't know if you've heard of this or not. But some of our modern billionaires have agreed to give 50% of more of their wealth during their lifetime up to the deadline of their death. They've made this pledge. And um, that's been actually great for their PR. But there are some who have become skeptical because of some of the problems that they found. I'll mention a couple. Um, In the past decade, the people who signed the giving pledge, their wealth has actually increased by 95%. If they are looking to give away their wealth, they are doing a really bad job of it. And unfortunately, we all know, this is sad, but it would be very easy to make a pledge that you never intended to keep. And then you get to enjoy the goodwill of everyone thinking you're such a generous, wonderful person. While you're alive, you still get to enjoy all the money that you're supposedly generously going to give. And then when you die, if you never do give it, well, it's too late. What are they going to do then? And so I want to be clear. I don't know their hearts. I don't know what they're actually going to do. I need to say that. I don't know. But I want to be clear what Zacchaeus is saying. He's saying something different. In the Greek, he's saying it in such a way that he's saying, I am right now. I'm not going to wait till I die. I'm not going to wait till later. Right now, I'm giving half my goods away to the poor. And he's not going to get a tax credit for it either, by the way. And so he's doing this. And and he's saying, I'm going to give it to the poor. And we might say, wait a sec. If you're doing a thank offering, isn't that supposed to be given to the temple? Why is he giving it to the poor? Well, I want to suggest to you that Jesus realizes that his job as a tax collector has been to charge Roman super high taxes to the people around him. And the people hurt worse by this have actually been the poor. And so he wants to give back to them to, in a form of a little bit of a restitution for the hurt that he's done to them through his job. But Zacchaeus isn't done. He isn't just going to give 50% of his money to the poor. Next, he says that if he's defrauded people, he's going to pay them back four times what he defrauded them. Now, In the English, it it sounds a little bit fuzzy, right? Like, if I defrauded somebody, then I'll pay them back. But in the Greek, you can say it with absolute surety that this is the case. So we could actually very rightly translate this. If I've defrauded anyone of anything, and I surely have, I restore it fourfold. So he's admitting it completely. 
and planning to do this. Now, the Old Testament law teaches that if you defrauded somebody and you became, felt, started to feel guilty and of your own free will decided to pay it back, you had to pay back the full amount and as penalty give them 20% interest. That's what the Old Testament law teaches. So if that's what it teaches, 20% interest as penalty, why on earth is Zacchaeus saying that he's going to pay 400% interest? What is going on here? Well, I'm not entirely sure, but what we think Zacchaeus is doing is he's actually applying the strictest punishment for robbery in the Old Testament. The situation was if someone had robbed someone's uh, sheep and then they were caught, not voluntarily, they were caught, and by the time they were caught, the sheep was either dead, the money was spent, then the person had to then pay 400% back. So it seems that Zacchaeus is not just admitting his guilt, but he's also um, kind of judging himself guilty of the worst kind of robbery and penalizing himself with the highest penalty possible. So, um, so he, he seems to really want to uh, do things right, to confess his guilt fully. And, and let's make no mistake, this is going to be a huge sum of money. I mean, if tax collectors spent a lot of money defrauding and extorting people, how much more so a chief tax collector, right? Remember, he's going to start by giving away half his wealth to the poor and then use the other half to pay back fourfold those who he had ripped off. It's first of all unclear how much money he's going to have left when he's done doing all this. And it's also unclear how he's going to continue as a tax collector with these new rules in his life. And we're left just asking ourselves, what has gotten into Zacchaeus? Right? What has gotten into this guy? We, we meet him and he's this tax collector. And the only reason you're a tax collector back then is sheer greed. Let's be clear on that. He is just a completely greedy tax collector. And all of a sudden he becomes overflowing with generosity. He moves from being one of the most corrupt men in Jericho to maybe one of the most generous people in the entire country. How do we explain this? Well, the only explanation we have is that his encounter with Jesus transformed him, right? And if it, it transforms Zacchaeus in such a radical way, Jesus can transform your life too, right? Zacchaeus isn't special, he's just an example. See, if you let Jesus into your heart, he won't leave it the way it is. See, he's not a normal guest. When you normally are a guest in someone's house, you follow their rules. You do things the way they want to be done. But that's not how Jesus works. He comes in, he changes things. You don't invite him in as a guest. You invite him in as your Lord. Jesus can't come in as a guest. He comes in as a Lord. And he starts making major changes. He doesn't just tidy the place up a little bit. He starts on major renovation projects. To speak about it more literally, he isn't just looking to work sin out of our lives. He wants to produce the opposite righteousness in our lives. See, we Christians, we can sometimes get this wrong. When we are battling against sin, we're striving to overcome sin, we can focus on the sin. We just get that sort of tunnel vision. We're trying to work on it. We're trying to get rid of it. And we have no vision of what our lives will look like living out righteousness instead. We're just trying to get rid of that sin. And if we're successful getting rid of that sin, all it does is leave a hole in our lives because we've stopped that behavior. We haven't filled it with anything else. So <laughs> nature abhors a vacuum. It's going to get filled up. It gets filled up a lot of the times with meaningless stuff or with other sins. And we wind up not really being much better than we were to start with. That's not how we're supposed to fight against sin. The biblical vision for overcoming sin isn't simply to stop sinning. It is to live out the opposite righteousness. See, see Jesus doesn't just want the absence of sin. He wants the presence of righteousness. Well, what would that look like? Well, the liar is supposed to not just stop lying but they're supposed to love the truth and speak the truth. The person who gossips isn't just supposed to stop gossiping. They're supposed to learn to be very confidential and to build other people up with their words. 
And if we were to turn to a famous passage describing this principle, Ephesians chapter 4, we would discover the rule for a thief. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. I love this. Do you see how our little corrupt chief tax collector has actually become the, the greatest scriptural model of this principle right here? Do you see that? He, he's done exactly what it was. He was a thief through and through. Make no mistake, he was a thief. And, but he has stopped defrauding people. Actually, he's actually paying people back way more than he even needed to. And he's going to work hard with his own hands now. He's not going to defraud people anymore. In fact, he's going to use his wealth to share and help the needy. He becomes the, the great example of this. Zacchaeus, the most unlikeliest of converts who Jesus sought out, one that we had to say, no one is too small to be found because this guy was a pretty bad example, right? He is the guy that becomes utterly, completely transformed by Jesus. That, that knocks my socks off. That is amazing that this really happened with a man like Zacchaeus. And if it happened to Zacchaeus, do you see it can happen to you? It can happen to me, right? See, brothers and sisters, in our, folk, in our fight against sin, are you just focusing on the negative, focusing on the sin? I got to stop, I got to stop, I got to stop. Think also about what you're supposed to be doing instead. The opposite righteousness. See, that takes faith. When you try to not just stop the sin, but you try to do what you're not, the opposite righteousness, you can't do that on your own. You know that. So you need to turn to the Spirit in complete dependence. And that's how we can get real success, through that same Spirit. See, the goal of true repentance is not the, simply the, the removal of sin, but the cultivation of righteousness. And by this, we see that Zacchaeus had truly repented, hadn't he? So in verse 9, Jesus continues, and he lets us know that something greater than just a change of attitude toward money has happened here. He says, salvation has come to this house. And if you think about it, in a very literal sense, salvation had come to the house, because Jesus had come to his house, and Jesus is our salvation. If only, if only Zacchaeus knew just what an honor he had that one of the last dinner dates Jesus ever took was with that man. The Son of God was in his home. But more than that, I believe Jesus means something much more. He is saying that Zacchaeus has now become saved. Now, What's the reason? Was it because of penance that he gave the money away? That's why he's saved? No, that's not the reason. He says, for he also is a son of Abraham. That's a strange statement. It's, it's so obvious. Of course, he's the son of Abraham. He's a Jewish man. All Jewish people can trace their descent back to Abraham. So what is, is Jesus saying? Well, actually, some people would have looked at a man like Zacchaeus and said, you're not a true Jewish person because you're a betrayer of your country. So in a sense, Jesus might be saying, you know what, despite what he did, he still is a true Jewish person. But I actually think he's saying much more than that. You see, the Bible teaches us that um, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham is one of the greatest examples of salvation through faith that we have. He wasn't saved by obeying the law. There was no law yet. He was saved through faith. That's it. Not by what he did, but by whom he put his faith in. And then we could read in Galatians 3, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. What the Bible is teaching is that just like a child resembles their father because they got 50% of their DNA, they're going to look like them in the same way, the true children of Abraham aren't the ones that share his DNA, but the ones that share in his faith in God. That's the family resemblance that really matters. So anyone who has faith in God and in Christ is a true child of Abraham. So, Zacchaeus, so Jesus is saying salvation has come to this house, not because of what Zacchaeus has done, but because of who Zacchaeus has believed in, because he's a true child of Abraham now. Put his faith in the right spot. And so we see here that yes, 
Jesus has transformed his life, but it's not because of anything Zacchaeus did. It's not about penance. But instead, we saw that he truly repented. He confessed his sins to Jesus. He didn't just confess them in a fake way. He really intended to change. That's what true repentance looks like. And he put his faith in Christ, and he followed him. He was doing what he said. He followed him like a lord. I don't know how much of all of that he understood in this moment, but, but you can see that the blueprint of salvation is right there in his story. And because of this, because of his salvation, Jesus has transformed his life. And if you want a similar transformation, we need a similar faith. We need a similar repentance. We need salvation. But Jesus wants to conclude this whole thing with one last sentence in verse 10. Let's just look at this one. It's the most famous verse. It says, for the Son of Man, that's how Jesus describes himself, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. See, this verse isn't just a verse that we could say sums up our story this morning, but you could say it sums up the entire Gospel of Luke. I know we haven't done much in this little mini sermon series, but in this series, we've seen that Jesus is for everyone. There's no exceptions here. He is for everyone. Why? Because he came to seek and save the lost, and everyone is lost without him. No exceptions. So there are no exceptions to this, so he is seeking everyone. He didn't just come to seek the decent people. He didn't just come to seek the respectable people. He didn't come to seek the religious people, or the well-to-do people, or the people who have their acts together. He came to seek and save lost people. He came to seek and save sinners. And since we are all sinners, all lost as a result, he came to seek and save every single one of us. That includes the case. That includes the crowd. That includes me. That includes you too. He's seeking us. Jesus is actively seeking to save sinners like us. See, if you think about it, if you're lost, that means that you must actually belong to him. Because you can't lose something that's not yours, right? So what's happening here is this is describing our relationship with our creator. Because since he created us, we belong to him. But sin separated us from a holy God. That caused a gap, a division, a problem, an estrangement, if you will. And because of this, we have a problem, a sin problem. We're lost. But the solution isn't to find yourself. The solution isn't to just work out and improve yourself or give to the poor like Zacchaeus. The solution isn't to find yourself, but to be found by him. Because he can solve the problem, not you or I. And he did that already for what happened just weeks after this encounter. He went to the cross. He died there for our sin. So that if we will confess our sin and repent and put our faith in his death and resurrection for us, we will be saved. He will be our Lord and our God, and he will change our lives for the better. Have you done that? Have you put your faith in him and been saved? See, Zacchaeus was looked and sought out by Jesus, and he's looking for you today too. He's calling you by name. He's asking for you to let him into your life, into your heart. Will you keep that appointment with him? Will you do it? See, Here's the thing. If you just start seeking for him a little bit, if you just open yourself up to him that little bit, it's not going to take long before you find him because it's easy to find someone who's already looking for you, right? Sometimes if I'm out shopping with my wife, she's a little bit more hardcore than me and I lose her sometimes. But it's so easy to find her again when we're looking for one another. No matter how big the store, you can always find somebody who's looking for you. Jesus is seeking you. He's seeking you even now. Will you, will you allow yourself to be found by him? Will you seek him too? Seek a seeking savior. Won't you do that? That's my call for you. What have we learned? We've learned that Jesus is already seeking you. It wasn't your idea, it's his idea first. We've learned that no one is too small to be found. No matter what you've done, no matter how insignificant you might feel, he hasn't forgotten you. He is seeking you. And Jesus can transform your life. When you let him in, he makes changes. He starts to draw righteousness out, to, to cut sin off. 
So this morning, my appeal to you is to seek a seeking Savior. It's a choice that you will never regret, not in this lifetime and not for eternity either. Let's pray. Father, we thank and praise you that we have a Savior who searches us even though we completely don't deserve it. God, so often we are cold towards you, and we've all spent many years turning our backs on you and enjoying sin. So, Father, we thank you that you still seek us out. You still have offered a means of salvation to us. And for each one of us who has received that means, we pray that we would not forget that you still seek our hearts out to go deeper and further with us. And so, Father, sometimes the changes you make, they can feel difficult, but you do it for our good. And so, God, we pray that we would participate and cooperate with the Spirit as he seeks to change our lives. And, Father that we would always, always be seeking after that wonderful, beautiful Savior who is ever seeking after us. God, we pray your blessing and help to seek him more, whether saved or unsaved, this day, excuse me, and this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.